joining us today. My name is Jolene Olson, and I am a partner and administrative vice president for the Factor Service. We are delighted to bring you this series, A Market Wizards Dialogue. In this two-part series, Jack Schwager and Peter Brandt will interview each other and discuss the various ventures that they're engaged in right now. Welcome, Peter Brandt and Jack Schwager. Uh, thank you, Jolene. Uh, this you. is Peter. Jo yeah, Jack, you're on? Yep, I'm here. Okay, well, hey, this is great, Jack. I, what, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to have a, a couple of these webinars to be able to chat back and forth. We've known each other for for a while. I was thinking this morning, we've we, you know, you and I've had dinner in Miami and in South Carolina. We've had lunch together in L.A. and Las Vegas and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, breakfast in Denver, and I'm sure I'm not even remembering all of our times. And it's just, it's just been a pleasure to be able to spend time with you over the years, Jack. Well, likewise, you're you're a friend, Peter. Yeah, well, I consider you one too, as well. Uh, you know, here's what I'd like to do today uh, for those of you who are in our audience is really uh, introduce uh, Jack's newest venture, which is. Uh, which is just a fabulous book, and it's here in front of me that I printed out over almost two reams of paper. Uh, and and uh, it's a complete guide to the futures market. And uh, I'm a futures trader, and so whenever somebody introduces a book, especially by Wiley, which is my publisher, called a, a complete guide to the futures market, it's something that that makes me sit up and listen and be very, very interested. I, I've got all of Jack's books over the years, which included a 1982 book by the same title, and here we are, what, 20, uh, 24 years later, uh, 34 years later, with an update of that book. And it, it is just, I think, going to be uh, the standard bearer uh, relative to uh, people uh, being interested in the futures market. And, uh, I'm just going to go through the chapter titles here, Jack, and then I'm going to start asking you some specific questions. But uh, this is a big book. This is this is this is not a small book. This is not a short read for everybody. And I think the book comes out in January. Is when it comes out, Jack? Yeah, but January 4th is the latest date I've got from them. Yeah, well, that's great. But I mean. We've got, uh, you know, for beginners only, just a review of what the futures markets all are about. The great fundamental versus technical analysis debate, which I'm going to ask you about, Jack. Uh, chart patterns and technical indicators, types of charts, uh, linking contracts for long-term chart analysis, trends, moving, uh, moving averages, ranges, support and resistance, chart patterns. Uh, another chapter I'll talk about to you about, Jack, is chart analysis still valid? Technical indicators, mid-entry and pyramiding, choosing stop-loss points, setting objectives, the most important rule in chart analysis, and I'll come back to that one, Jack, technical trading systems, structure and design, uh, selecting the best price series, testing and optimizing trading systems, how to evaluate past performance, another one I'll ask you about, Jack. 14 popular fallacies uh, or what not to do wrong. It goes into uh, uh, extensively into uh, fundamental analysis and seasonality, almost 100 pages on that. Uh, future spreads and options, again, a big, big, big section. Uh, a practical trading guidelines, how to develop a trading approach, 75 trading rules, 50 market wizard lessons. And then, Jack, you go into uh, 86 pages of regression analysis and different forms of regression analysis. That's uh, that's not a section of the book I spent much time in, Jack, because I've got to tell you that 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 deep water is way, is way over my head. But uh, the, the point being is that this is a complete a complete guide to futures trading, is something I think the industry definitely needs. Something I highly recommend. Uh, to members of the Factor Service, uh, th this is this is heavy reading and must reading, uh, you know. And, and chapter one I love is is for the beginners. And question I'd like to start ask uh, out with here, Jack, is uh, I'm a futures trader. 
a lot of the people, the market wizards you've talked to and interviewed over the years, I think there's been over 70 that you, you've interviewed, uh, an awful lot of them trade futures, and there's, there's, there's got to be reasons they trade futures. You trade futures. Uh, for those out there that are stock traders and have only uh, considered futures, why, why trade futures, Jack? What are the benefits of the futures market? Well, a, lot, a number of them, as you well know, Peter. But what maybe the what I'd say the biggest one is futures markets pretty much allow you to trade the world. You know, so you could you could trade you know you can trade all sorts of metals, you can trade all grains, you can trade interest rates, you can trade futures, uh, currencies, uh, you can trade stock indexes. You could basically trade any market in the world. And uh, so that that's that's one great advantage. Uh, the uh, the liquidity of the markets uh, is is a big advantage. Uh, they're the most liquid markets among the most li well currencies are are, are of course uh, the in the bank market is is extremely liquid, but that currencies are also in few part of futures. Uh, so there's liquidity aspect. There's the uh, uh, relative low cost of trading futures. Uh, uh, if you trade stocks, uh, if you're know, trading active stocks, there's, I mean, that, you know, then you do have narrow bid ass, but uh, a lot of stocks there, you know, may not be uh, uh, as easy to move into, especially getting the small cap uh, stocks. Uh, but it's it's essentially a, a market that is easy to trade, uh, allows you to trade anything, and is relatively low cost. It also doesn't it also doesn't require a large capital outlay, although Mentally, you need to think of the amount of money you're trading as larger than the margin, obviously, or else you'll be in big trouble. Uh, but it does allow you to not have to put up uh, a large amount of money to control a large amount of assets. So those are all those are all advantages, and uh, those are ones I would list. Yeah, let me just ask you a quick question. I wasn't going to, but you mentioned it. You use the word margin, and think people think, why is the word margin wrong when people are thinking about trading? Futures mark. Why is that not the proper term? Well, it's well. I mean, technically speaking, it's uh, it's a good faith deposit, uh, and roughly speaking, I don't know what is. The, I haven't looked at it recently or recent years even, but I guess five percent or a little less is what you typically have to put up of the of the contract value, and. Uh, 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 of course, if the market goes against you, it's just a good faith deposit. You don't have to put up more. Uh, the thing, though, is that you you don't have to tie up a lot of cash, but you do need to think in terms of, you know, if you're trading, if you're putting up five percent. Well, you don't have to think of it as a hundred percent, but you really should think of it as uh, as uh, that. Uh, your, your account should really be your your mental account. I would say should probably be. Uh, Ten times that number. Yeah, well, that's that's great. Thanks for that uh, that clarification. I, I that's one that people don't quite understand. I think a lot, and that that's good, Jack. Yeah, chapter two. Yeah, uh, you have it's the great fundamental versus technical analysis debate. Uh, t talk to that point uh, to that chapter, would you? Jack? Yeah. Well, you know, this is a kind of a theme. Well, first of all, it's a theme personally. I, I started out as a fundamental, uh, purely fundamental analyst, thought that didn't pay any attention to technicals or charts or thought it was just, you know, well, I come, my background is as an economist and, uh, you know, educationally and so forth, so so maybe predisposed to, to be skeptical of, uh, of things like charts and stuff. But, uh, so I started out from that one end of the spectrum and ultimately ended up at a spectrum where I was just literally 100% technical. Uh, that's not to say that that is what I'm recommending for everybody. It's just to say that was my own personal journey, but I've had experience in both areas, and that's why I could write a book, which also talks a lot about fundamentals. Because I did a lot of work in that area. <clears throat> the, the the debate part of it is that you you have people who were you know like I started out who believe fundamentals is the way to tr look at markets and have disdain for technicals, and then you have plenty of people on the other direction. And what I have found uh, basically through my Marco Wizard books where I've interviewed lots of people which range from pure fundamentalist uh, uh, to pure chart people and uh, finding people in both camps that were extremely successful. So uh, so there is this debate and I think it's one of those things where you know both sides are right and both sides are wrong. <laughs> 
you know, there is no absolute right answer. It's not like fundamentals is right and technical is wrong or vice versa. They are both right for the right person and then they're, you know, wrong for the wrong person. And I think each person has to, to discover which approach resonates or works for them. And for some people, actually, it's a combination of two. So I can think of somebody like, a, you know, a great trader like Bruce Kovner, who was a phenomenal fundamental uh, uh, thinker, you know, he would basically, this is a this is a guy who could discuss with you the economic situation of every developed country and uh, understood all the major uh, trends and currencies and interest rates across the globe, how they interacted, the history of them going all the way back, and yet, it came down to trading, would also pay attention to charts uh, for entry and exit. So he's somebody who's kind of the bodies of like a hybrid approach. So uh, the, the debate basically is that, and uh, and the conclusion I think is that uh, neither one is absolutely right or wrong. It's really a matter you've got to discover which one works for you. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and Bruce Kovner is probably, uh, I, I'd have to say he's my hero. I mean, he is, uh, I admire him so much, and uh, he, he's, he's probably among a handful of the best traders that uh, uh, that have traded these markets. You have a chapter in here, Jack, that I just sat and laughed and roared about. It's your chapter three, and for those of you who, who order it and receive it, it's one that you're going to enjoy. And it's, it, The title is Charts, Forecasting Tool or Folklore, Folklore, and you have a little dialogue going on here, Jack. It's set up as a dialogue between Professor Coyne and Ms. Trend. And, uh, in the moderator, and I, I just, I, I am Professor Philip, myself. Philip Coin. Yeah, Philip Coin. I, I tell you, I just about, I just about laughed till my stomach hurt uh, on that one, Jack. Uh, uh, it's, it's so, give, give just kind of a, a peak preview of what that chapter is about. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you liked that because I had some fun with that chapter. Uh, to re the readers to really appreciate that have to be old enough to have. Be familiar with Ruckheiser's Wall Street Week because uh, it's a bit of a parody of that show. Um, and those of you who remember that show, uh, Ruckheiser was a great punster, and so I kind of uh, ran, I guess, rampant in that chapter with uh, with puns. <laughs> but uh, uh, but anyway, I just uh, had fun with this idea of whether with a debate, uh, it was it's a, it was a obviously fictitious debate between. Uh, a professor who's a proponent of the efficient market hypothesis, and uh, and a, uh, a young lady who's a uh, chartist, and uh, and that's what the, that's the premise of that chapter. But it, you know, they get across, although it's just, part of it was just to have fun with the humor of it. Uh, but they get across the very real ideas that uh, that um, you know uh, the the, uh, the the technicals have a lot to do. That the, the the efficient market hypothesis people miss a lot of things about why technicals work. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I uh, I, I used to watch uh, that show, and that was uh, that was a great watch each week. You, you then at the, at this point in the book, in chapter four and five, you you get into charts. I I just appreciate, by the way, Jack, the amount of of space that you devote uh, to the charting, and of course. You know, if most people that are listening in know that charting is has been my livelihood, and I boy I appreciate the amount of attention you gave to it, and the amount of attention you gave to a whole a wide variety of things in dealing with it. You deal with uh, it, it, the types of charts, bar charts, line charts, uh, candlestick charts, close only charts, point and figure charts. And then you get into Chapter 5, and I want to ask you about that, Jack. It's linking contracts for long-term chart analysis, nearest versus continuation futures. And uh, the, the, I get a lot of questions from factor people on this subject, Jack, because I tend to do most of my analysis with certain kinds of continuation charts. Uh, and, and, and talk a little bit about this whole concept because I think it's a little confusing for stock people when we start getting into how we do create these continuation charts. Talk a little about that, Jack, and a little bit about uh, how you lean on the subject. Sure, sure. So, um, well, if you, you're trading stocks, you basically 
have a long history and is, you know, it's one continuous series and pretty straightforward. And if this splits, the thing gets adjusted backwards and stuff. So you're always dealing with one clean series that shows that if, if you go back and you look 10 years before and you look at a price and it's $10 and now it's 50, you know that if, if you bought it 10 years ago at 10 and it would have gone up $40, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Trouble with futures is most of them have very, uh, very limited lifespan. So you have a few, the only real exceptions are Euro dollars, which is a trade for multi years uh, of liquidity. But, but by and large, futures, many, in fact, many futures are only liquid for less than three months. Uh, if you go back beyond that, you start getting a lot of spaces and dots and lack of liquidity type of looking in the charts. Uh, you certainly can't get multi year charts out of them that are meaningful, except for a few markets. So, um, so you have to solve this problem is how do you look at, at, long, at the long term? And I know, Peter, you and I, are similar in many, many ways uh, in the way we look at markets and, and, and charts and technical analysis. And one of the similarities I know we have is we both believe in, you know, it's kind of uh, ridiculous to just like look at a three-month three or let alone end of day chart and not know what the big picture is. And, and so ideally, you don't really want to start with a 10 or 20-year chart picture, know what the big picture of the market is, and then go down to, to a three-year or one-year um, and, and if you maybe then go down to one hour, but but bottom bottom line, you really need to see the big picture, or else you don't know where you you don't know where you are. So uh, it's like a, it's like if you were blindfolded and dropped in the middle of New York City and were asked to, to describe what the United States looks like. Uh, well, if all you've seen is just New York City, you'd come up with a very very distorted uh, picture of what the United States looks like. And so you really have to see the big picture to start. And you can't do that with futures market, futures contracts by themselves. So you must link the contracts. The question then becomes, how do you link it? Well, the, the initial way it was done and the way it's still done and it still has a purpose is you take one contract, it, it expires, you take the next contract, link it, and so on. Well, that, that sounds fine and that sounds good. And, and that, that, is, that will give you a, an accurate description of, of the price level, and I really want to emphasize the word level here, the price level in the past. Uh, so it will tell you where a market was. So if you look at, at a market and it was, uh, it was $2 10 years ago and uh, you now it's $4, uh, you know the level was $2, but what, you, what, what changes in futures is unlike a stock where if it goes from $2 to $4, you know, or maybe let's say, uh, let's say the, Take a large number, say twenty dollars uh, to fifty dollars. That's a thirty dollars. It's thirty dollars higher. Well, in futures, if you're looking at a, a long ago price, you you can say the level was twenty or thirty dollars lower. But what you cannot say, and this is critical to understand, is that the market has risen thirty dollars. It's entirely possible the market could have gone down in that period. If yeah, you would have actually lost money being long. Now, how is that possible? The reason it's possible is because there are gaps at the rollovers between contracts. And when you link the other contracts without adjusting for that, those gaps, then uh, you, you don't have uh, an accurate, you don't even have, a, in many cases, a remotely uh, accurate or even representative picture of what's happening to your equity. And so, if you're concerned about your, your, what your account looks like, what your account equity looks like, whether you would have made money or lost money on a trade, then it is absolutely critical to link contracts in a way that adjusts for the gaps at rollovers. So if you, let's say, if ideally, let's say if you typically roll over, uh, let's say if you have a sort of a rule that you roll over the first, the first day when the new contract has more volume than the next contract, or let's say 20 days before the ex contract expiration or any rule, whatever that is, if at that point you link together contracts and you check what is the gap between the contracts and adjust the price series for the gap and then keep a cumulative running total as you go through time. Of course, you do this, uh, this, is, this is done either, you know, either by program software or you'd have a program, you wouldn't actually have to be doing this manually. But bottom line, the series you're looking at should be one that adjusts for the gaps at rollovers. And then that chart will represent the price moves as opposed to the price levels accurately. And in futures, you can't represent both. 
you can only represent the price levels accurately or you can rec represent the price movement accurately. It's impossible to represent both because once you represent it one way, you automatically are not representing it the other. So, you, so if you want to know levels, you look at a nearest futures chart. If you want to know price swings, price moves, magnitude of moves, you must, must look at a continuous futures chart. Um, anybody who, who says otherwise is basically uh, ignorant or, or wrong or both. Um, so th those are those are my strong feelings on, on that subject. Well, thanks, Jack. I'm I'm going to have to consider myself a deplorable on that one, I guess. Uh, no, not really. You know, I'm sure. No, I, let me let me because let me just specify here. So um, and then then you'll tell me if you, if you disagree because I don't think you would. Now, if you're looking at chart analysis, if you're looking at charts. You probably historically you probably want to look at both. You probably want to look at uh, nearest futures because that gives you the, the historical levels. So if you're looking at support and resistance and stuff like that, you want to look at a, a nearest future chart. But you also want to look at a, you must look at a continuous future chart because that's the only chart that is giving you swings accurately. So if you you're looking let's say for something like a measured move swing and equal swing, well you know you, you need to adjust for the gaps and rollovers. For trading systems, I don't think there's room for nearest futures. For tra trading systems, if you are programming a system or testing a system or trading a system, it must be continuous futures uh, because otherwise the results of the system will not match your account, and that's obviously not a good thing. Now, if you could disagree with that, Peter, I'd actually be interested. How? Uh, well, my disagreement with it, uh, and I agree with you that, that, that there's a room for both. There, there's a place for both. Uh, and I'm, one of these days I'm going to have to maybe spend a couple of pages in a factor update to discuss this and, and show, uh, show what both types of charts look like. But my main complaint with back adjusting is because that's what you do is you end up having to back adjust prices is that you end up with a chart that shows four or five years ago prices that never existed. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, but 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 I'm for both, and I and I think I think on this one where I come down, Jack is, is you know there's an argument to be made for both, and the question a trader needs to ask himself is which type of chart works best for me, uh, you know in in all things I think it comes down to which type of chart works best for me, but. Uh, I, I think I'll send you the write-up that I eventually do on it for your review before I put it out and get your feedback, Jack, and we can... Yeah, so no, I, I agree with you, Peter, and, and uh, not only can you get not only you get prices, by definition you have to get prices that didn't exist because if you want to represent the accurate price swings and there are gaps and rollovers, by definition the prices are not going to match. Uh, not only that, you could actually go back far enough, in many markets you could actually end up with negative prices. Obviously, so for stuff like support levels, that's not going to make any sense. Uh, uh, so that's why I say you need both. You have to go nearest futures as well. But for anything that wants that you want to reflect price swings, uh, particularly like I say, trading systems where you want the movements that the system believes is occurring to match your account equity, then you must use a continuous series. Yep. Yep. Well, good. Thanks, Jack, for your input on oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry. One other qualification here. A uh, fine point, but it's important. Uh, if you're using uh, if you use continuous futures for percentages, it won't. You can't use it. You can only use the the price change. You for the base, you still would need to use nearest futures, because uh, otherwise it won't work for percentages. So, because uh, again, the price levels are not accurate. So you have to use nearest futures for the base to measure how much of a price move occurred uh, in a percent term. If you're using percentages. Uh, thanks, Jack. That good clarification. Hey, Chapter 15. Uh, people, I think, are going to find most interesting, and this is this is something that uh, you, you all you often hear people say. Well, you know, charting doesn't work, and there's just too many too many cases where charting doesn't work. I don't I don't believe in charting because it it doesn't work. You have Chapter 15 called the most important rule in chart analysis, and Jack, this is one you and I both agree on. Would you speak to this? Sure, sure. And I, when I sent you this book, you know, I knew Peter that that was uh, that you'd really uh, re that that chapter would really resonate with you because I know the way you approach markets. Um, 
and and that something this is something I I discuss, you know noticed or discovered very very you know very early in my career once I started looking at technical analysis charts, and that is that um, you have take any pattern you want breakouts whatever uh, you you've got lots of failures and people will say oh well charts don't work well if you're going to believe that you uh, if you're gonna if you approach a chart analysis is you you've got a textbook definition of these patterns and whenever they occur whenever well, let's say let's take a simple one like a breakout you got a trading range you get a breakout okay so every time you get a breakout that means the market is going to go in that direction and and, uh, and when you find when you do that and then a lot of times you buy it and then the market goes you know, goes back down and you lose and you lose and you lose it happens a lot of times you say hey this is a bunch of garbage this doesn't work well if that's gonna if that's the approach you use it's not gonna work the point is and this is the the key point of, of that chapter and I would say about all the everything I wrote about chart analysis it's the most important point to me and that is it's not so much the patterns that are important it's what the market does after the pattern so uh, if you have a breakout and the market then fails and goes back into the range, that that as a failed signal can be a much more reliable signal than the actual breakout itself was. So um, that chapter goes into many kinds kinds of examples of failed signals. And my contention is when when classical chart analysis doesn't work, that's actually those are actually really good signals, uh, better than the uh, the original signals. And so you need to appreciate and understand that and not take it as a cookbook type of approach you have to pay attention uh, you know the, there may be an edge to the classical chart pattern working but if it doesn't work you've got to give a lot of weight to that and failed patterns are among the most important things uh, tools I think in any chart traders book and I know that I know that's something that you do a lot of yeah, oh, absolutely, Jack. You know, I, w w I define fail patterns as a pattern in itself, you know, as a singular pattern. And so you, you look at a, at a symmetrical triangle that fails, it, it produces uh, what Schaubacher called an end round. Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee both, uh, both uh, identified the failed head and shoulders. Uh, and so yeah, absolutely. Fail patterns are very, very significant. I've always said that actually chart patterns in and of themselves do not provide a trading edge. It is, uh, it's risk management and it's some of the techniques of trading those patterns that really give the edge. You in the book, in, in part four, Jack, uh, spend 80 pages. I love this and I haven't read it yet, and uh, but I will at some point. And you talk about mechanical trading systems, and and, and you you go, you go deep into it, and uh, it's it really it deals with the issue of uh, will one be a systematic trader or will one be a discretionary trader? I am a discretionary trader. I I add judgment to the equation on just about every trade. You're talking here in in the book about people who who. Uh, move away from discretionary trading toward systematic trading. Uh, the question I have, Jack, is uh, give us the the narrative for why one would would become a systematic trader. What uh, what is there about systematic trader trading that that one should consider as being an appealing thing for them to do? Okay, great, great question. Um, and, and interesting, if just for my for back for context and background, I went from being uh, fundamental to chart oriented to being to going to systematic, and then going back and then eventually just being discretionary chartist again. Um, but it all it all deals with uh, what you're comfortable with. Now, one the, the the reason I originally went from from discretionary to the systematic is the one big advantage of systematic besides you being able to test things and so forth, which is a big advantage. But in actual application is it takes the emotion out of trading because if you're going to be a, a true systematic trader, anything, if you if you ever find anything that gives you a reason why you want to interfere with the system or set, you know, or do something different than, then if you're a proper and good systematic trader, 
you should then change the rules to incorporate that thing that you want is making you want to go different. So over time, the system should reflect exactly the way you want to trade because if it ever is in conflict, you should then modify the system so to get rid of that conflict. Uh, so by definition, you should get at a point where the system reflects the way you want to trade. Now the great part of that is it takes the emotion out of it because it's automatic, it's computerized, it, you fed it the rules you wanted to do and so forth and, and that's one big advantage of, that's the big advantage of, 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 uh, of uh, systematic trading and for many people, for most people, maybe emotions are the big pitfall because human emotions are just not very <laughs> helpful for trading and uh, I mean the good traders can really be stone cold and uh, and don't let their emotions uh, get in the way and uh, you know you can't tell whether they're you really almost can't tell whether they're having a great day or a bad day because they they're just doing it as a process and it's it's like a job it's they're focused and it's not what it, it's then they're not getting all emotional about it now I, I don't have that quality which is one of the reasons why I went more you know, for a while went the systematic route. But that's the advantage, it gets rid of the emotion. The, the, the negative of that, of course, is you don't have control uh, if you're following the system in that sense. And uh, and you may have to, and, and, and that means that for the system to work, you have to allow a good amount of risk on many trades, because if you don't, you'll be getting, the system will be getting knocked out of good positions all the time. So uh, that requires a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> your ability to take that, you know, those interim losses uh, uh, without directly controlling it. And so ultimately for myself, I felt more comfortable just having direct control and being able to just immediately get out of a position if I didn't feel right about it or whatever and, and, and took care of the emotional part about it. Uh, the way I solved that, we talked about Bruce Kovner actually in what I call Bruce Kovner's dictum. Um, so what I apply to my uh, trading is, uh, is, is his, his rule that know where you're getting out before you get in. So to me that means, and I think Peter you do exactly the same thing, uh, if I'm going to enter an order, that order doesn't go in alone. That order goes in with, with a stop loss attached. So the emotion is taken out of it because uh, I've already decided what my worst loss is going to be other than slippage and uh, and I don't have to think about it. And so the, the order goes in, the stops there. If the market's going to go dead against me, well, it's going to go against me. It's already, I've already taken care of that. I, I've limited the amount of damage that can be done by the stops. I've taken the emotion out of it. So uh, that's, that, but uh, yeah, if, uh, if you don't do that, then certainly systematic trading, uh, is advantageous in that it, it does get rid of the emotion. Yeah, thanks, Jack. That's that, that's that's good insight. Say, there's there's a book you wrote that a lot of people don't really identify as is really uh, a book. They think of you as the Market Wizard series, right? And there's a book you wrote a couple of years ago called Market Sense and Nonsense that I've I've tried to promote everywhere I can. Uh, and you're not noted for it, but I think it's actually really one of the most brilliant things you've ever written. And you get into how the markets really work and how they don't. And you get into a lot of metrics, how to evaluate performance. And you have a chapter in your book on how to evaluate past performance. And in that chapter, uh, you you talk about really is, is good ways to measure and what are bad ways to measure, what metrics are the best metrics, what metrics do people pay attention to that actually don't really count for much. Uh, to, to explain that, to talk to that a little bit. Sure. Well, you know, actually I've adapted that chapter for this uh, complete guide as well. So the, the, the performance analysis chapter in this, in this book uh, was adapted from that market sense and nonsense. Um, Okay, so, so as far as, as measuring performance, I guess the biggest message I would have is that the mistake most people think is uh, they, they look at return, particularly when you're evaluating, uh, forget about just being a trader yourself, but if you're, you know, if you're looking to invest in money managers or whatever, um, or, and if you're looking at, uh, at performance, uh, people look at, tend to have bias to look at returns, you know, I, I got beat, 
you know, people say to me sometimes, well, I've, you know, I've been making 30% of return on your interest and knowing about more. And to me, it's a, it's a stupid comment because how do I know what your, I don't know what the risk is. You know, you may be making 30% return, but you might have 60% drawdowns and it's just a, you know, matter of time before you, you blow out completely. So my, my main point about performance measurement is that return alone is a meaningless measure. Uh, you have to, you have to normalize it by, by a risk measure. Um, and the analogy I use is, uh, it makes as much sense as, uh, now that the pound has go down, the analogy isn't as good, but, uh, you know, my, my analogy was that you, if you go online, you're looking for hotel rooms in London and, uh, and one room is, uh, one room is 250 and the other room is 200 and they're both ident- on a different site, it's 200. Uh, and, and, they're on, and they're both identical rooms, exactly the same. Which ones are better? And of course, you know, it sounds like a trick question because it is in a way. Uh, because of course, you take the the cheaper one, it seems. But I say, well, what if? Uh, and let's think in terms of the pound being 140, 150 instead of what it is now. But I say, well, you know, what if what if one side is in in terms of the pound and one side is in terms of the dollar? Uh, so if the 200 is in pounds, it's no longer the cheapest one. And my point there is, it doesn't make sense to just look at price unless you normalize it you know, in terms what is the denominator? Is it pounds or dollars? And in terms of trading, uh, the denominator is risk. Is is and whether you're using the you know vol- use volatility or use uh, uh, some loss measure or whatever, you you need to normalize it because otherwise it makes it, you get real distortions. For example, I tell people you want to double. Your, I'll tell you how to double your returns. It's very easy. Just put on two times your position every time. Of course, you'll lose twice as much every time you lose. So, so that doesn't mean you become twice as good of a trader. It just means you're risking twice as much money. And so you need to control and normalize for that. Now, as far as specific measures, uh, I'm not a big fan of the Sharpe ratio uh, for for the reason that that the measure it uses to 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 normalize. I mean, it's okay. It's not. It's not. It's 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 re, It's okay. It's not just not the best measure. Uh, but it uses volatility to, to, to normal to demonstrate risk. And volatility, in many cases, will be a reasonable proxy. Where it goes wrong, though, is that um, traders aren't really risk is, risk perception or what we feel is risk is not really volatility. It's loss. Uh, I mean, I've never met anybody, any trader who had a problem of upside volatility. They're making too much money. You know, that's never a problem. The problem is losing money. Now, the Sharpe ratio doesn't distinguish between upside and downside volatility, which is which is what the problem is. So you can have traders who are very good at controlling their risk and let their profits run, the cliche, but true. And a trader like that will get some really big gains. And so you'll get upside volatility. And the Sharpe ratio will say that's bad, but it really isn't. Uh, so that's you get that type of distortion. Uh, so that's why uh, that's the w- w- main reason why I'm not a big fan of the Sharpe ratio. So I think it's better to normalize with something that really relates to what people identify with risk, which is namely uh, loss. And there are a number of ways of doing it. Uh, the Sortina ratio, which uses downside you know, downside volatility, is one way. Um, I my own favorite measure is something I call a gain to pain ratio, which simply sums up all the re- uh, ideally using daily data because it's most meaningful with daily data, but you sum all the daily returns, positive and negative, and you divide it by um, uh, the uh, sum of all the, the absolute value of the sum of all the losing uh, days. And that gives you a very, very good measure of the return you're making relative to the risk you're taking to make that, that return. You could do it with monthly data. It's just daily data gives you more information. And uh, uh, from the, the interpretation is different from monthly than daily because obviously when you get down to daily, you could have mon- many, you have months, positive months, but you still have daily losses. So the daily number is always going to be much lower than the, the monthly number. You have to be cognizant of that. But I go into all of that. Well, th- thanks, Jack, for that explanation. And, you know, members of the factor service know that that's that's something I talk a lot about I've I've, I've presented the actual formulas for uh, for gain to pain and Kelmar which I follow uh, Jack knows that I follow something called 
profit factor, and we've talked about that. But I, yeah, I, I think it's important. You know, people trade the markets, and uh, they know what their rate of return is, but they don't know the internals. That's like taking temperature of a patient in the hospital, but not uh, taking a look at his blood or doing X-rays. And so it's important. You then in the book go quite a bit, and I'm not going to have any questions for you, but I'm just going to mention it, Jack, a, a big section on fundamental analysis, different types of fundamental analysis. You you then venture in, uh, in into spreads and options on futures. Great section for people becoming acquainted with the futures market to read. Uh, and then in chapter, uh, in part uh, seven of the book, uh, in, in chapter 36, you talked about a planned approach to trading, and that's one of the four pillars of the the factor service. And it, you know, deals with the process. It deals with approaching trading as a business, as a serious business. Uh, is it, speak to this planned approach that you kind of get into in in chapter 36, Jack. Well, for one thing, obviously, you have to have you have to define what your approach is. Uh, so. Uh, you know, you just can't be like the shoot, shoot from the hip approach and hope you make money. Um, one of the big things I advise, I believe it's in that chapter, and it does take work and discipline to do, but it is very helpful, particularly for early on traders and uh, as you're learning and developing, and that is keeping a log of, of uh, not necessarily every trade. I mean, you can certainly keep the results of every trade, but I'm talking about actually um, I, in the ideal sense to give you people an image, you would actually print out a chart of when you get it, if you're, let's say you're a chart trader, you print out a chart of where you got into the trade, annotate why you got into the trade, and then follow up with uh, with uh, why, when you got out, why you got out, and and most important at the end of that, when the trade's complete, if there's a lesson to be learned, write it down. Now, most of the lessons to be learned will be from losing trades. That's the way it is, and uh, and in fact, if you to become a successful trader, I think you have to be able to capitalize on learning from the from your losses so whenever you do something that that you see that was was wrong not that and not that not a trade that you <laughs> let me be clear here not a trade that you lost money that's not the same thing as being wrong you could have a trade that lost money that is a perfectly good trade and you should take every time it comes up because you know uh, it's like uh, if you're getting paid uh, if you're getting made two dollars every time a coin a fair coin is tossed heads and lose one dollar and comes out tails and you keep on betting heads when you lose on heads that's not a bad bet that's still a good bet same with trading if you've got an approach that works if you lose money or not as long as you follow that approach it's not a bad trade uh, so that's not relevant what's relevant is when you did something that was wrong or you overlooked something uh, and you say oh, okay you know this trade didn't work because when this happens I, I gotta be gotta remember you know that uh, uh, when this happens, I've got to change. I got to do this, or or I should have gotten out. I saw this happen, and I didn't get out. Never do this again. You've got to basically write up what the mistake was. And sometimes, you know, sometimes though, you may get a pattern or something that 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 works. It's not, let's say, a common pattern, but you want to keep it as a reminder. And you say, well, here's a good pattern. You know, uh, here's an example where it worked. Uh, keep this in mind. Look for that. Whatever. It doesn't always have to be uh, write up a lesson on the negative. It uh, can also be unpositive, but but in practice, the most of the lessons that you'll learn will be from the losing trades. And if you keep those and you keep them in sort of a log or a diary, and then you periodically go back and review them, uh, it will do one thing. It should do one thing for sure, which is worth its weight in gold, and that is, it should keep you from repeating the same mistakes uh, as often as you would. Maybe, hopefully, not repeating them at all, but certainly will cut down repeating the same mistakes. Uh, so just reading it when you did that, if you read that a couple of times, you make the same mistake. The next time, for example, I'll just take something for myself. I, uh, I I basically, like you, Peter, make decisions at the end of the day, right? And I, you know, during the day I look at the market sometimes and uh, and I'll make trades. And I kept on saying every time I make a trade during the day, I lose money. You know, it's like I said, I'm just going to stop. I just can't. Like anytime I'm tempted to do a trade during the day, I'm not going to trade. You know, it's just not going to do it. Uh, so, uh, so it's that type of thing. You have to be cognizant uh, uh, of what your mistakes are, so you don't repeat them. Yeah, hey, that's and that brings me to really to my next question, Jack. And it it's your chapter 37, which uh, which is 75 trading rules. We're not going to go through all 75, but 
name one or two or three of, of those 75 that most resonate with you. Gee, I don't think, you know, I'll tell you, honestly, Peter, I put that, you know, I put that, those are like rules I do by charts and, you know, uh, I don't even remember offhand which ones I put, what I put in, you know, honestly. Uh, I can actually pull a, let me, uh, I'll pull my old version here. See if that pops up, just to get people to know what we're talking about here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I I don't know which which are my my favorites. Uh, basically, um, I mean, maybe you want to just pick out a couple that resonate with you offhand. So, uh, yeah, well, there's so many. I, it's just you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's just common sense stuff, right? I mean, you you talk about some of it, yes, and some of it not. You know. Uh, yeah, so some of it, yes, some of it not. But there are things I just like noticed about markets. Or, uh, yeah, I, I, well, I'll give you a couple off the top of my head. I, I believe they'd probably be in there. So, so for example, um, and it, I'm, this is not as most important, but just to give people a flavor of what type of thing we're talking about. So, for example, probably one of them would be if you're ever in a tr if you're in a trade and it works right, you know, if you get most, if you're looking for a certain type of a move and you get most of it very, very quickly. You know, for my opinion, and again, this is not common sense. It's not necessarily even right. Maybe a lot of people disagree, but I found, you know, if that happens, just take it. You know, uh, if you get most of your move very, very quickly, just take it because even if you get the whole move, there's a good chance that the market will probably correct. You'll be able to put the position back on uh, and get in a, you know, and, and ride that trade again at a better price. So uh, that's like an example of it. These are just things like observations I had. Uh, uh, you know, uh, o over time, uh, uh, or if you're, I think one of them may be if you're going to get in a trade and it goes against you immediately, uh, you know, get out. I, you know, that type of thing. So these are just things like, from experience, you see these things happen and you just mark them down. And, and yeah. my list may not be somebody else's list. I think it's a good idea for people to have their own list. No, I, I think a lot of these lists are, you know, the interesting thing is as I read through these. I realize that every one of them has probably given me a black and blue mark at some point, and uh, <laughs> well, that's how, that's why they get in there, right? So they give yeah. me one too. That's why they yeah. get in there. So you know, like, uh, so don't make that mistake again, uh, type of thing. And, uh, yeah, well, that that's awesome. Then you, uh, I'm not going to question you on it, but I'll just mention it. You have a a chapter on the 50 market wizards lessons, and you've done a number of those books. Those are great. And then you 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 end the book in in really kind of uh, a, a way that I mentioned earlier takes me way over my head. It's 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 an appendix, but it's oh, a yeah, the, hundred page appendix on regression analysis and and things like that. And for those of you who are into the math, uh, the math of trading, the statistics of trading, you'll uh, you, you'll love that section. Uh, again, it it uh, it took me in the waters that are deeper than I wanted to go, but uh, you know, my recommendation for everybody is order your book, uh, get it now, go on Amazon, order it, let's put Jack's book in into a position of the number one selling financial book and keep it there for as long as we can. It, it's not it's not an inexpensive book, I, I think it's uh, over $100, I've ordered it, Jolene's ordered it, uh, even though I have a, a copy that's printed out of my printer, I'd like the real copy. Uh, and then you'll have to autograph it when we have lunch or dinner together, Jack. But Absolutely. I, I highly recommend it to people. Uh, it's great. I want to turn a corner here, and it may take us a little past past the one hour mark, and so I'll apologize uh, apologize to you for it. Jack is also engaged in an endeavor that that I am fascinated with, and it's called Fun Cedar. Uh, Jack, explain a little bit what Fun Cedar is, why people should be interested in Fun Cedar, what fun, what is this Fun Cedar thing all about? Sure. Well, the the the, the, the origin concept, and and I should say, you know, um, the fun company was started with three partners, uh, um, of which I'm one, and the main the main the main mover on this, and the person whose idea it was is a fellow by the name of Emmanuel Bellari, who's the CEO. And he's the one who pitched it to me year, several years ago uh, and asked me to join him in it. 
uh, in any case, the, the basic concept was to create a, a web-based center where you could connect traders um, and investors. So, well, we've done it basically with two separate websites for, for legal reasons, uh, but from the trader side, the idea is the um, the trader is able to get their put their put their link their accounts to to the site, have their accounts updated their uh, daily, be able to generate all sorts of analytics and charts. You know, for example, just to, to get a uh, I think it's great to just be able to get an equity chart to get a chart of your equity and have that updated uh, every day. That's very helpful. Uh, and to run analytics on it, you can even do uh, you can even do stuff like test. Uh, well, what if I uh, what if I use a crossover moving average on my equity curve and and got out when you know the moving average turned down and got back in when it moved to turn up that type of stuff. But in any case, I'm getting off on a tangent. The idea was to to get to give traders the opportunity to link their accounts to have these accounts verified in real time because the numbers are coming from their broker uh, and uh, get get people globally uh, to uh, to participate and traders across the globe who have talent to put their accounts up and to discover trading talent that otherwise would have no avenue to getting any any uh, any investment capital because you could be a great trader but if you have not gone to an Ivy League school and particularly if you you know and if you have no connections per se and you, you don't have a big you know big amount of money to back you anywhere um, you don't have the connections then the, you could be the greatest trader in the world. Nobody's going to find you, pay attention to you, and you'll never get an interview. You'll never get anywhere. Um, so the the idea here was to to to, to sort of uh, globalize and democratize this process of, uh, of of traders being able to become managers if they have skill. And so anybody anywhere in the world can go on, put their account, and if the numbers look really good, they have an opportunity to be discovered, and then. Uh, we and investor partners uh, can use that database to find trading talent and allocate to them. And, uh, and already, first allocation has already occurred, uh, and there'll be, I'm sure, a lot more. Uh, and we're just early on, very early on, on the, on the fund seeder investment side. So that's only very just beginning. <clears throat> but that's the idea. The idea is, you, no matter who you are, if you can trade, if you've got skill, you can demonstrate it by putting your account up there. And have the opportunity to be to, to manage assets. Yeah. Now this this is a, well, well, this is a good question. Is it's, it's, I'm putting a ball up on a tee ball here for you, Jack. What does it cost somebody to be able to to get all of the metrics and and uh, material that uh, that that come out of Fun Cedar? How much yeah, does so, it cost them? Yeah. It cost it cost uh, it cost zero. So. Uh, uh, sort of using the Google model there, I guess. Uh, so the idea is. We didn't want to put any impediments into people joining, you know, signing up and linking up. And uh, our 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 goal is to get a larger base of traders, hopefully good traders, across the globe as possible. And if you put any cost on it, obviously that would impede that that, that potential. So uh, uh, our our way of monetizing this is not through uh, uh, the trader. Uh, <coughs> Well, it isn't directly through a trader because those traders who are the, the ideal model is those traders who are successful, you know, who are good and discovered, and end up getting allocations from the investment side. We will have then agreements with uh, with those traders to to share in in, uh, in fees they earn. Uh, but that's only the only cost. That's only if we're directing money to them. And uh, but otherwise, there's there's no cost at all. Yeah, you're, what you're really talking about, Jack, is is really in real time, finding the next people that you might put in a Market Wizards book, right? Well, yeah, I mean that's that's an offshoot of it, of course. So, so the thinking is, well, if we've got a site here to discover global trading talent, then kind of a neat book uh, would be to do a book which I've got tentatively titled "Undiscovered Market Wizards," and where not now, but maybe a couple of years from now, after the site's been running for a few years and able to identify a number, you know, a number of people globally, uh, pick the best of those people, and, and I kind of envision myself doing a, a globe, around the globe uh, trip where I interview those people. So uh, eventually, they, uh, that is the plan, to have a book come out of this uh, uh, that will feature some of the best traders that were found through this process. And uh, 
so that's that's part of the project. But the main part of the project is really to find these traders, and then uh, through our separate company, Fancy for Investments, connect them with uh, institutional type investors. Uh, now this is for futures, forex, and stocks, correct? Okay, so right to... now, right now it's futures and currencies uh, essentially. But certainly, you know, but, no, 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 but anybody trade equity as far as our, the allocation process, because the registration, our, our registrations on the fund seed investment side are uh, right now just for the futures side. But our plans are certainly to expand that to cover equities, and, and that will be done once the appropriate legal compliance and registrations, you know, everything is done strictly according to the rules. Uh, so that's the only thing that's impeding us from, from doing anything there right now. Uh, but the, the, the trader side is separate, and we are certainly seeking and actively encouraging equity traders to link up. And in fact, probably we have more equity traders than futures traders. Uh, so all traders should. It's just a matter of time. We can only we can only do things one day. You know, we can't do everything at one time. So the, the investment side that is that has now gotten going on the futures and FX side. Uh, but our our absolute intention is to expand that to certainly include equities. Uh, that's wonderful, and uh, you know, it may not be for everybody. How many how many traders are you now tracking on Fundseeder? Well, we've got I think I, I didn't I think the most recent signups were around 5,000, uh, and then there's various degrees. I mean, uh, traders uh, uh, there there are there are people who who have linked that have signed up. But there's probably several thousand of actually linked accounts, or, or, or accounts, or I should say also, I should make clear because we we can only link with, with, with brokers where we get their cooperation. So, and it's also work to link. Every broker you link to requires programming and software. So we have some major uh, major partners, uh, broker firms that are, that are linkable, but not certainly not everybody. So when there's brokers that are not linked. Uh, traders can still put up their numbers. They'll be called. Those numbers will be uh, identified as as unverified because we're not getting the numbers from the broker. We're getting it from the trader. But all the same analytics, everything else would still apply. And we will still you look at that database because we understand that there will be perfectly legitimate traders who will sign up but won't be able to link because their broker isn't isn't uh, isn't linkable yet. So we we, we still uh, look at that database as well. So there, uh, I don't know how the breakdown right now is between a link through brokers, link uh, uh, people who have put up their numbers, uh, otherwise the people who have just signed up and haven't yet uh, set up their account. Uh, but there, but there's, uh, but there are, uh, like I say, about a total of uh, roughly 5,000 signups, I think, at this point, and the numbers are, are growing continually. Thanks, Jack. And they come, from, they come from all over the world. I think we have over 100 countries represented. Yeah, you know, I recommend that uh, people check out Fundseeder, see if it's uh, c uh, capable, see if it's connected with your brokers. Uh, I mean, for me, I would I would see it as uh, as very valuable for two reasons. One is it, it just gives you it can give you great metrics on your trading. It, it really, I will tell you, I, I believe sometimes that uh, trading produces metrics, but metrics can govern trading. I mean. Metrics, you can get a designer trading program by understanding your metrics. At least that's been true for me. But also for traders that you want to trade, but you, you for a living, you want to be a full-time trader, but you do not have enough capital in your account to really be a full-time trader, and you envision that it might be a long time before you generate enough profits to get there. Well, one option obviously is to is to seek outside money. Think of it this way: if you're if you're managing a certain amount of money, let's say you're managing uh, three million dollars, which for me equates to about uh, a 30 contract position, and you you're taking 20% of profits, it's the same thing as being able to uh, trade six contracts with no downside risk. And so, um, if one's inclined to want to be a money manager, be a trader uh, and being a trader by managing money, it's it's a great way to establish a track record. But anyway, Jack, that's about it uh, for today. We've actually come in and landed this. Yeah, you did, you did extremely well. Yeah, you could you could do network TV with that time accuracy. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks, Jack. I I really appreciate it. I ask people yeah. to. Stay tuned. 
Yeah, Thanks. we're gonna do we're gonna do this again, and Jolene, you're, you'll send out a notice right to people uh, the next time Jack and I will get together, and there'll be Jack mainly uh, uh, trying to get into my head at that point. Yeah, but let's change roles. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and giving us an hour of your day. We certainly appreciate that. And uh, uh, Jack, have a happy Thanksgiving and uh, hey, you too, Peter. enjoy yourself. And thank you all for for participating in this. Thanks, Jolene. I'll let you close it up. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Peter and Jack, for allowing us to be a part of this dialogue. Please stay tuned for more information regarding session two of this series. Well, Jack will talk to Peter and he will give us his insights on 40 plus years of trading and also what's on the horizon for him. Thank you again for joining and I hope you have a fantastic day and weekend.